We miss a hundred percent of the shots that we don't take. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Athlete Podcast, sponsored by Sports for Champions. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by professional basketballer and coach Nate Montgomery. How are you today? Yeah, I'm great. No, I'm really uh, excited to be here. Oh, Not done anything like this before, so it's uh, I'm really, really excited. There you go, straight in at the deep end. Oh yeah, there you go. Um, brilliant to have you here today. We start at the very beginning on all these podcasts. Can you tell us about how you first got into basketball? Yeah, so um, a lot of my family has been involved in basketball. Um, so even from the ages of four, really, my dad got me a little basket in the uh, living room at home and said, I'll have a go at that. And mm. uh, a few shots went in. And I guess from there, the sort of dream starts. Right. Um, so yeah, got into basketball around four, started playing competitively at nine. And then uh, it's just gone from there. I've played every year since not had a break or anything so it's just so straight into basketball were you playing any other sports around that time yeah so I think sort of around seven eight nine I was you know I tried cricket football you know all the standard things that English lads do um and I was pretty good you know I wasn't you know terrible at them but uh there was a clear first choice um I think from just naturally you know the shots kept going in and you can't ignore that when you're uh a young kid when you see the ball go in it's a pretty special feeling definitely yeah if you find you're good at something especially when yeah. you're young it's definitely worth pursuing isn't it no of course um, and then obviously I'd imagine uh, Yorkshire kind of 20 years ago mm. don't imagine that basketball was huge in the area no. I think yeah it wasn't I mean I can't really remember doing it much definitely at primary school I can't remember doing it much at all and uh, secondary school I think we had like a game two or three games a year mm. you know we weren't really playing and to be honest because no one else was really doing it I wasn't too pushy to you know get involved because we just didn't have the uh, you know we had the baskets and some old basketballs but you know I think I mentioned it earlier about uh, kids today it seems to have really uh, took on you know really grown since then it's picking up, isn't it? And you start, you're starting to see, you know, in the little caged courts that you see, mm-hmm. like on, on your local estate or wherever, you are starting to see kids not messing about with a basketball of the weekend. Yeah. And that, that, when I was young, that was unheard of. No, yeah, same, yeah. I mean, to see kids, you know, walking down the street with a basketball in their hand and bouncing the ball and you see them waiting for a bus or a tram, you know, holding a basketball or wearing some Jordans. Uh, or some basketball shoes that they might wear outside. Like I think the culture of basketball, there's definitely like a, you know, you see people wearing kits all the time. They might wear LeBron James or Michael Jordan or you know these kind of players that are just worldwide. You know, and it's actually reached the UK now where they're actually wearing, you know, the kits and the shoes just in general wear. And it mm. just, I think, I think that as as a, um, you know, bringing eyes to not just to the the clothing but actually the sport in general yeah it kind of follows on doesn't it i think that's always been the big problem for rugby mm. um they just don't really have those stars to kind no. of propel the game into yeah. like the national conversation yeah um but you are seeing there's there's kind of a new crop of basketball stars no, now. definitely i mean uh, steph curry the you know the shooter at mm. all the kids who's your favorite player steph curry steph curry steph, you know because they see them do these amazing things um and you know you can't ignore that and, and that's what everyone wants to do now you know you want to chuck a basketball and open it it goes in mm. you know for my age group when I was growing up Michael Jordan when I was sort of four five six years old he'd only retired two or three years before that mm. so for me I still you know I was watching v- VHR you know videos uh, VHS sorry mm. not VHR VHS videos you know all day every day of, of Michael Jordan and that for me is what like that's what propelled me to even want to start you know playing with seeing mm. him fly through the air you've never seen anyone do that before no. and I think other sports as well you don't see you know probably only volleyball but in terms of people just flying through the air or these amazing you know athletic plays once you see a basketballer do that it's not something you you forget mm. and it, I definitely didn't forget Definitely. Wasn't Space Jam then? Yeah, no, Space Jam, I mean, watch it twice a day. Yeah. yeah. It was just like, I mean, you know, to, to, to link that with the cartoons as well, I mean, as a young kid growing up, it's like. Yeah. It's amazing marketing, really, for the NBA. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. think about it. 
Um, and then, so you started playing competitively, you say at nine. Yeah. Uh, who was that with? So that was actually with the Sheffield Junior Sharks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was trialling for the under 13s. That was the youngest at age nine. group wow. at nine. Yeah, I got in the team at nine. This little curly head, you know, kid <laughs> turning up and uh, showing some of them older lads how to do it. And right. I think I think that's what still with me to this day is that I've always been fighting against or playing against older lads, bigger lads, mm. um, and always wanting to prove them wrong. And it started, I think, at, you know, at that nine years old, you know, playing at national league level, you know, against all teams up and down the country at, at that young. Mm. Um, was was like the starting for me was like I've got to show these guys what I've got and we'll probably come on to it in a bit but um, I imagine at that age there's a bit of a height difference people start starting to grow Yeah. Um, but I think it is important to note that like people do uh, associate if you're tall you could play yeah. basketball but yeah. if you're not you couldn't it's not yeah. necessarily true is it no I mean there was one quote my dad reminded me of you know almost weekly was don't bother about that bit how tall you'll get just be good just get good at basketball mm. and you know and coaches won't be able to ignore that if you're good you're good mm. and that's it at the end of the day and I've taken that through with me all the time and now even with my coaching you know when I see these young lads that were in my position and I think if I picked everyone based on height how many good players am I going to miss mm. you know you've obviously got to be some, you know have some tall lads but you gotta be good, yeah, yeah. and that's that's one thing I've always, you know, taken through. It's funny you mentioned that about the height thing because my my older cousin, uh, we played one year together at juniors, and it was that first year, mm. and I think he was about um, six foot two at thirteen. Wow! Uh, and obviously, I missed out on that the height gene from that Almost side of the way, family, yeah. and we were playing in the same team. And there's some funny pictures actually of. <laughs> of him playing it you know he was a bit older and then there's me that's just like offering around near his up to about the middle of his stomach wow. you know but um, yeah I'll well, never forget that moment so brilliant what kind of um, position were you playing when you first started out uh, I've always been the same mm. you know I think if you don't grow straight away then it's it's difficult to move up into a different position I've always played point guard slash shooting guard you know um, can you tell us a bit about that position yeah, so a point guard would generally be like your centre midfielder in football. Mm-hmm. It's the best way uh, to describe it. Um, look, look, very vocal, you know, quite unselfish, mm-hmm. um, looking to pass, you know, finding your teammates in space. But then also, you had the shooting guard aspect. There's the other position as well, is actually being able to find space mm-hmm. uh, to get your shot off. And then obviously being good at shooting and mm. having, having a repet, you know, repetitive action that leads to some consistency because um, at the end of the day the ball's got to go in the basket you know, and that's what people get paid to do so mm. that's what you're always working towards Makes sense, yeah um, and is that something that you've worked on from an early age presumably, that getting that repetition getting finding that muscle memory and that groove of shooting, has that yeah. always been important to that's, you? Yeah, very, very important um, again with my dad you know, we spent a lot of hours on the back garden just trying to perfect the action, you know, the technique every time I shoot, trying to get it the same and, you know, looking for, you know, what position your body's in, the balance point and all that different stuff. Mm. You know, sometimes it probably got to the point where we might have been over analysing certain things because I think we're quite similar like that. You know, mm. you're like really over analysing what's going on. And the other side of it is, you know, shooting to find your confidence, you know, and uh, all those things combined, you know, you see some of the best shooters, like I said, Steph Curry, like, if he's open, he shoots the ball, mm. there's no in between, so that's something I take into my game is that I've done all this practice for so many years, as soon as I get the chance to shoot, whether it, you know, if it's a good opportunity, then you've got to shoot the ball, mm. or else... And that goes to your quote that you started with. Yeah. You know, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take because you work hard and you do all, you sacrifice all this stuff to play. you got to shoot the ball when you're open. Definitely. You know, that's the end goal is to... And there's nothing better than, you know, seeing that ball go through the basket and I'm so lucky that when that does happen, I've got, you know, when we're playing at home, I've got all the home fans from Sheffield, you know, cheering, which is, you know... That's amazing. You can't really beat that. 
Um, how long did you play in the juniors? So I played well from nine to eighteen. So I spent sort of nine seasons wow. or nine years. Um, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, I was you know lucky enough to uh, to win MVP, which is that player of the year, um, nearly every single year, wow. um, all the way up, which is something I was proud of as you know as as a junior player. Now the jump from junior basketball to men's basketball, even amateur men's basketball, which is what I did, mm. was a uh, you know it hits you in the face. You know it's a it's a big it's a big leap, mm. especially for someone of my stature. You know it's it's not an easy jump. Um, so that's a difficult you know it's difficult, but you know I was mentioning earlier that um, you've got to find a way of figuring it out mm. you know whatever size you are position you are so I think with you and your dad being quite detail orientated did you put mm. together a bit of a plan thinking okay well the opposition is going to change my teammates are going to change yeah do you adapt to anything you were doing um I don't think it was a, a matter of adapting too much uh, to them individual moments I think it was more adapting to uh like say like finding ways to be consistently good mm. You know, because I've always, you know, I always had the talent to have the moments, mm -hmm. but it was finding a way of having long periods of consistent, good basketball being played, and then that gives the coach confidence then to keep you in the game for longer. Mm -hmm. And I think at that second, when I was playing for the second team, you know, sort of around, I was playing that probably between sixteen and nineteen men's basketball. Uh, he coached me for two of those years. As my head coach, and I remember he, um, he used to sub me out of the game, and and I'd, I'd come off and I'd be like, I ain't done anything wrong. He says, No, you didn't do anything wrong, but you didn't do anything. <laughs> and 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 for at that age, I'm sat there, so I'm, I'm sat on the bench like, I should be in the game. Well, I don't know. But that was like a real turning point, you know, in terms of actually, if you're gonna get in the game, no matter how old you are or what you look like or whatever. You gotta go and do something mm. to keep yourself on the court, and uh, that's true from being nine years old under thirteens to coming on when you're playing professionally. You know, it's the same same mindset. You might as well go and do something now, mm. if you or else there's no point. Are you a competitive person? Yeah, I think competition's driven most of my life, mm. no matter what I'm doing. That is that being a young, uh, you got siblings. So I've got an older sister, right. which is quite. A, she's she's about six and a half years older than me. So she, she's not. She that's wasn't really not too sport. Much direct rival, no, uh, you know I was more. You know I was com comparing myself at young age to my older cousin. Yeah, and we spent a lot of time together. We played together at pro level, mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of seasons. Um, so he was always the. Um, benchmark for me or you know he's a lot taller than me we played different positions but we trained a lot together mm -hmm. you know and and he taught me a lot um and there's always that bit of competi friend you know friendly competition yeah. that drove us both forward i think but competition's what you know any sports person needs i need it like mm -hmm. i can't i don't think i've ever done anything or many things that i've been good at without some level of competition mm. sometimes take it too far you know even if playing video games as a kid or something and you know you end up having big arguments and stuff mm. like that but um, I've always just loved competition whether it's hobbies like golf you know we're always playing for something playing for points or mm. you know put a couple of quid in there or something like that mm -hmm. like you need that or else you know for me it don't, it don't bring the best out of me just you know, playing something for, f even though I'm having fun, yeah, yeah. but that's not the main. You know, relevant. Yeah, you want that bit of something on the side that, you know, to bring a bit of pressure on. How, how do you deal with a loss and has that changed as you've kind of moved into the seniors? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of sports, sports people as they grow up, losing is difficult to handle, I think. And we didn't, I didn't do a whole lot of losing when I was younger because you know we had a good successful team mm -hmm. um, as you go into you know I say seniors and stuff like that the competition is a different level mm -hmm. um, and you're going to lose 
you know there's no team that hasn't lost uh, well there's not many anyway um, so it's definitely how you deal with it rather than the actual fact of the loss but it's what does your next day look like what does your next training session look like what's the atmosphere around the team you know all that kind of stuff that you've got to factor in when you do lose um, because the losing's a habit and people get used to losing whether you like competition or not you can get used to losing mm. but you can also get used to winning and it's it's a very very fine line and that's what I've, I think that's the biggest thing I've learned about professional sport is the fine line between winning and losing you know and in a game where you, you know there's gonna you might score a hundred points so there's a lot of baskets going in mm. two or three moments in that game can determine or can I play a big role mm. of, of winning the game or losing the game and it's even in the league at the minute it's so so close some games you walk away and you've got your hands on your thinking how did we lose that mm. and then you look you look back at the you know you watch the tapes from the game and you look at the moments and think mm. Mm. and that's that's as a team you work into them small bits not the big ones mm. you know if you lose on a last second shot have you lost on the last second shot or did you make four or five mistakes in a row as a team yeah, yeah. earlier in the game it's very rare that, that last minute moment there's yeah. been five or six things during yeah. the game that would have affected even more yeah every single time I mean free throws mm. when you get fouled you get two free throws if you sh as a team if you shoot 90% mm. you're you going to lose by a point yeah or if you if you sh uh, you know sometimes a team might have an off night and they shoot 50% from the free throw line mm. if you shoot 20 of those and you've only made 10 mm. and you lose by 10 yeah yeah you know, it's a clear. There's just little bits during the game because mm. it's such a momentum shift game, so quick mm. that them little bits really do matter. But then there's also the chance that you can make it back. Mm. You know, you can be down by 20 points with 10 minutes left, and momentum can get you through. Yeah, I was gonna say it's such a high sport scoring game basketball mm. that if the momentum does shift, there yeah. is the opportunity that you can really pile on the other team. Oh, yeah. Do you feel that during games? Maybe like it could be even like a refereeing decision mm. or a little bit of luck the way the ball yeah. bounces. No, ba basketballs really can be influenced by refereeing right. decisions, and I'm not saying bias in it in any way, mm. but just in terms of because it's so quick and the, it's very difficult to referee mm. and if they do make a mistake and there's some contact where it's affected the shot mm. or anything like that and they miss it then you know it does add up course, you know yeah. if you get three four five six decisions like that mm. it's um it can be quite detrimental and it's difficult as a team to mentally fight through that because you feel like you're playing against the team yeah. against you and you're playing against the referees. How is the respect for the referees? I know there's a lot of work to be done in sports like football. Yeah. I think rugby do it really well. Yeah. Right? How's basketball? Um, I think basketball is a bit of a hybrid between the both. Right. Um, there's clear rules. Any dissent towards a referee is called a technical foul. Mm -hmm. If you get two of those, you get ejected. You get yeah. disqualified so from the game. Yeah. So there's definitely that element of demanded respect mm -hmm. you need just even if even if you didn't like the certain referee or whatever yeah you have to have the respect or else you're just not going to play yeah so and from that respect there's barely any tolerance on it so mm -hmm. most of all it is a respectful game mm -hmm. it does boil over of course and i think a lot of that could be avoided with good communication mm -hmm. but it's definitely get i've seen a lot of referees and coaches especially and players talking a lot more mm. which is something I'm a real big advocate for I think that's that, that's great and watching oh, what's his name that you know the rugby referee is it the Welsh guy I'm not sure he's really famous for it and I've watched some of their clips from rugby and it's their communication is exceptional oh I and the mic top and the deal yeah, yeah I amazing. love those videos because yeah, I think yeah. that's how sport should be mm -hmm. you know and in such a game like rugby where it's controlled aggression yeah. to the highest level to have that communication with to have that such such civilised conversation mm. and clear thoughts yeah and passing coming, over the information so yes. that everyone if you yeah. feel they've been wronged this is why we've made the yeah, decision yeah it's uh, and 
a lot of the time in football I think that gets you know the the reasoning behind it and basketball there's a certain level of that mm. um, it's tough isn't it it's a bit of a yeah. vicious cycle because then without the information but then yeah. I think referees probably are a little bit worried to open up that conversation too yeah. much due to some of the things that have happened yeah it's I mean, really difficult yeah. I mean, basketball's a really controlled game yeah so as a referee I think it's you know it's a difficult job mm. you know it's very difficult um, and they're they're doing the best. You know that's one thing you've got to keep in the back of your mind is they are you know they are trying to do the best at the end of the day. They're do, doing their best job mm. to keep their job. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the communications are you know a really important part. I was watching a there's a famous scandal in in the NBA where uh, a referee was allegedly you know fixing, and it's on Netflix now. It's really interesting. I can't remember the uh, the name of the guy or what it was called. Mm. But he was saying that with certain calls, he could influence a game six points in either direction. Wow. So that's a huge... In the just with little innocuous just, things. That you yeah, just little it. bits here and there. Because this, this, it's, it's so controlled and there's so many different rules mm. that that sort of stuff can get wow. hidden quite often. So even though referees aren't actively doing this, mm. certain calls, when they're made or what's, what calls been made... It can Im- it can really influence the yeah. game whether it's on pur- I don't think it's on purpose no, and I would never assume that yeah but it can yeah just those little nice. decisions can add up to the uh, you know to the to the end of the game I think then it's it's sort of incumbent on the people playing the game to not let those decisions affect mm. you because at the yeah. end of the day you can't affect the referee no. you see it in football all the time there's yeah. no point arguing no. decision's been made yeah. Just cl- you've got to clear that from your yeah. head haven't you and it's, move on yeah, it's so, it is so difficult you know you see the highest level players mm. still lose the you know they lose the call mm. and it's you know the least the least it can affect the team the better yeah that's it um but it's so difficult. I mean, that's. But I think that's one of the beauties of sport in general mm. is that you've got all these people who've mas- almost mastered the sport, and yet still there's so many different determining factors that that make it the best. You know, make it fun to watch. Yeah. Because yeah. at the end of the day, you play sport for the supporters. Yeah, yeah it's for the entertainment. You, the fans, you know, so. yeah, and that's what drives the sport forward. Mm. So at the end of the day, it's an entertainment industry. Um, with a bunch of people who love to play sport yeah. and uh, basketball I think for anyone out there if you might watch this is one of the best spectator sports um, there is I think because it, it's so, it gives everything I think yeah you know it, I think it's, it's to me sort of from the outside not been a huge basketball fan my mm. whole life watched quite a little bit but um in terms of like the American sports that have come over, mm. it makes so much more sense than any of the others. Like it's high yeah. scoring, there's yeah. relatively low barriers to access. Like yeah. you can play, all you need is a ball and then there's plenty yeah. of courts out there. Yeah. You know? um, and you could really, I think I said to you earlier, it is the second highest growing sport in the UK after mm. women's football. Yeah. So it really is on the up, isn't it? I know, and it's, it's such a shame that... Um, from a governing body standpoint, that basketball, at the, especially at the grassroots level, has not received enough funding. Mm-hmm. For in 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 terms of comparing that to the growth of the sport, you know, if if I don't know who might listen to this, but as a sport, you know, we need the funding because there's so many people who want to. We want to lower the barriers of entry mm-hmm. to get as many people playing. Um, because it's such a fun sport to play, you know. It's it's one of those sports that just hooks you in. The amount of people I speak to all the time that say, you know, they say I just can't stop watching it. Mm. You know, and they spend hours and hours a week, mm. not with any monetary benefit. Yeah. Actually, deficit. You know, they're spending money because mm. they just love it that much. You know, so you know, if if uh, if the sport can get some funding, who knows where it could. You know, and the ultimate goal is to get the national team. Yeah. competing at the high level and if we can get eyes on that mm. you know it's it's uh, who knows where we could go but the professional games in, improved a lot it's yeah. getting there isn't it yeah. there's, there's other countries in Europe where it's huge like mm. Spain I know it's got a massive following even yeah. like the Czechs yes. Germans yeah. um, 
and yeah you see there's so much room to grow we're such a sport obsessed nation yeah and i think probably 10 20 years ago we we're just quite resistant to mm. anything else sort of coming yeah. in but i think that is slowly changing yeah well i think we i mean as a country we've been uh, you know england well the uk has been definitely focused on football and, and, and cricket and, and stuff like that and rugby mm. and we've been successful so i guess at that point there's no reason really to mm. intro- try and introduce so many different sports. Um, but I think the more access to TV, YouTube, mm-hmm. all these social media things, you know, people can s- get their eyes on basketball mm-hmm. without having to pay or pay too much, mm-hmm. you know, and all these social media things. You can click of a button, you can watch basketball. Yeah. And 20 years ago, you couldn't, you couldn't yeah. really do that. So yeah, as, yeah. as a kid growing up, where, where do you go? Mm. You know, whereas in fo- football, as you're seeing them on the TV, you can go down to your, you know, from being from Sheffield, we've got two massive clubs, mm-hmm. you know, that at, it's it's down the road. Yeah, on your you know, you can, you can get on the bus and you're at, at the match for not a bad price. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, basketball's, you know, getting there, Sheffield Sharks, we've got a brand new arena. Tell, tell us about because so you went senior with Sheffield Sharks. Yeah. So you've been a one club man. Yeah. Still there now. Can yeah. you tell us a bit about first breaking through into the senior squad? That would have been your first pro contract, is that right? Uh, I think I signed it a year after. Yeah, a year after that. Yeah. So you were, is that does that mean you're an amateur for a year and then you go pro? Uh, so I was. Um, it's quite a unique one, really. So I was obviously playing with the second team, mm-hmm. and then I've been. I was training with the first team. Uh, but training was more stand and watch and right. taking information mm-hmm. and look at the level that we're at yeah. and when you do get your opportunities in training how do you do mm-hmm. what decisions are you making are you up to it Yeah. and uh, you know I spoke quite openly with my coach who's been my coach for a number of years at Tiber Lions and uh, you know we, we, he said we had a conversation not too long ago he said the first couple of years just weren't at the level mm. and uh, and do you agree uh, looking back yes yeah looking 100% uh, at the time maybe not as much but I understood there was a gap between mm. me and some of the other players yeah um, and like what I said earlier about you know consistent play as a younger player it was very inconsistent so I'd have moments where uh, you know, you show some great potential, mm. and then there's other moments where it all gets a bit too much. Um, and you know, as a, I'm still only 24 now, yeah. so there's still those moments where the inconsistency creeps in. Mm. Um, but yeah, so and you know, we used to invite, they used to invite some some of the uni players to come down, of which I was one. Mm-hmm. And we used to train at eight o'clock in the morning, and. Uh, I just used to turn up, stand on the side and watch, turn up, stand on the side and watch mm-hmm. for ages. And uh, some of these other guys stopped turning up and uh, I carried on. Because I thought, at that point, I thought, um, what other, what's better than this? Mm-hmm. You know, what, what am I going to do at this point yeah. that's going to benefit me more than being here? Yeah, it makes sense. You know, so I just carried on stayed there and uh, halfway into my first year at uni you know I had a chat with the coach and he said you know if you want it then we'll put you on the team Mm -hmm. and I was like yeah of course Mm -hmm. and uh, it's been an you know it's been an up and down journey ever since Um, you know there's difficulties for all players and I've had my own you know issues and, uh, and stuff to overcome but uh, yeah, from there, it, you know, it's been a steady incline. From there, you know, just being around the, them kind of players, professional people, mm. hanging about with these kind of guys and sharing a locker room with them. And if you were to share one sort of the main takeaways with them when you start sort of training with professionals, mm. seniors, what would be the main sort of takeaway that you applied to your own sort of training or game? I think. Um, I think it's the intensity when you don't feel like it mm. because I think when you come across I think you come across some people who say like 
I'm like this every day, every day I feel great and blah, blah, blah. And you see these Instagram reels where this is how to wake up every day and feel great. And this, yeah. you don't wake up every day and feel great as a professional sports person. Mm. You wake up, you're hurting, your knees hurt, feet, ankles, hands hurt. Yeah. You know, you might have just got hit and jolted your back. You know, and, and one thing I learned was that that they're not, you can't sit out unless it's mm. bad. And if you're training, you're going 100%. Yeah, of course. And that was one thing for me was like, and I had an injury to my knee. I tore my meniscus in my right knee. Right. And uh, that period of sitting out and watching my friend, you know, some friends and teammates training and playing was like someone dangling it in front of your face and you're behind a screen. And I remember from that point on, I said, there's not going to be unless I physically can't train I'm never going to miss a training session how long were you out for? it's a funny one out because it was the worst timing possible so I injured my knee in the February 2020 and we all know what happened in the March of course, wow. and for whatever reason I managed to get my scan so I had a private scan done thankfully mm. uh, just in time just in time but they weren't or we weren't there was no knowledge really of whether I could even get the surgery done so I ended up needing a, a, a minor surgery on it yeah and I didn't get that surgery till uh, December 2020 uh-huh. and the season started in September and then uh, I sprained my ankle the week I was supposed to come back oh, no. one of the worst sprains I did so I ended up being out for over two months Jeez. after the surgery yeah and the season ends at in May, so I was. So I think I was there for about off. six six weeks. Wow! You know, and um, that was for me. You know, the lowest moment, but also a very defining moment in mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, who am I as a profession as a professional player? Mm. You know, and and the sort of mindset you take into every day, and, and actually appreciating what what I'm actually doing. Even you know, sometimes things don't go your way and certain decisions don't go your way from from whatever mm-hmm. but actually you know you look back and have a bit of perspective on the, the matter and think well you know it's I wake up every day and I get to play basketball yeah, like yeah. it's not bad it's not a bad way to live at all and mm-hmm. the pains and groans and everything that everyone every sports person goes through is actually something you look back on and you think yeah like that you, you push through those moments and you have your best moments sometimes when you least expect it yeah. um, or when you're feeling your worst something good happens and it changes everything changes everything so yeah that'd be my biggest takeaway is that you know you gotta you gotta play whenever you can because mm-hmm. you, you never know how long it's it's gonna last for and that was one thing for me you know I started playing at 19 at, at this training and playing at this level I'm turning 25 this year, you know, so all this experience has been uh, pretty special Can imagine to that. be involved. Um, can you tell us a bit about playing in the BBL and perhaps what you kind of hope for the future of the league? Yeah, so um, obviously making my debut, it's a funny story actually, uh, so there was a player that actually got released from the team and uh, uh, that was all up in the same time that I was just got in the team, mm. and um, they didn't have a they didn't have the right kit for me. Uh, they didn't get it quick. Like we didn't have it quick enough, and I ended up wearing these shorts because they were a bit bigger than me. Oh, oh quite big anyway. Basketball shorts. Yeah, so. these shorts were down my calves, so I'm like stood in the mirror looking at myself, thinking, "Have I got to go out and show?" You know. 500, 600 people what I'm, you know, this this kit I so rolled them up about six times and uh, making my debut then uh, and it made, I managing to hit the three pointer nice. uh, in my very first game it was uh, it was a bit surreal really um, I always try not to show too much positive emotion when I'm playing mm-hmm. in terms of engaging with outside you know I've always been quite you know just keep focused just focused on what so I didn't really take in the whole thing but it's when your teammates you know give you that 
mm. pat on the back and your coach gives you you know gives you a hug and you know everyone says well done and stuff like that uh that's the you know when i'm first made my debut that was unforgettable experience but in terms of the league it's been growing to, from when i first got there it's grown a lot we've had new investors in the league that have put a lot of money in so the production level of all the games and the you know just the whole stature of the league has grown so much um so for me hopefully we get more teams competing in europe so london currently compete in uh, the second division of europe which is a really high level mm -hmm. and they've got really far both the men and the women's team um so i guess my hope for the for the league is you know to get three or four teams three or four teams competing high level in Europe and then even some more teams competing at lower levels in Europe and uh, you know getting as many eyes on the sport as possible making it so accessible mm -hmm. you know and see we've got a deal with Sky Sports so there's some game, there's game on Sky Sports every week uh, all the other games are on YouTube every week you know the, they sign deals in, uh, in America TV deals so we're on in America in certain states Really good, isn't it? Stuff like that is, you know, if you'd have asked me if we've had this same, you know, conversation four years ago, they all would have said, "You are, yeah, you know, what, are you serious?" Yeah, yeah. Like, we, you know, we only just about had it on. We had this thing called BBL Player, mm. that was, you know, this really basic streaming system with, uh, and at our place we had like an automatic camera that just followed the game and yeah, it was not a good point. angle and the, you know mm -hmm. so to say from that to where we are now is is like it's 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 ridiculous the the, the improvements are amazing and it's for me it's like I'm so happy to be a part of that um, I know a big part of that is the general standards around the club mm. I know that you're now involved with coaching and I've been mm. for a couple of years can you tell yeah. us about that and maybe how important you think it is to the development of the game in the UK yeah um, yeah because I um, took it on when I was 22 I think so I've been away from junior basketball for four years mm -hmm. and I wasn't involved at all after I stopped playing for them and um they just, I had a couple of conversations with some people around the club and they said, I, I, what do you think about coaching a team? And um, to which I said, yeah. yeah, you know, which team do you want me to coach? And there was the choice between, I think, the under 16 boys and the under 12 boys. Mm -hmm. And um, I was advised to go for the 12s and I thought, oh, it's, you know, it's little kids and mm. you know it's this and that and under 16s it's proper basketball you know I'll be learning all this stuff and it was my cousin actually said no go for the 12s you know see what it's like that was the best decision I made in terms of the coaching but also personally um, being able to coach that and help me play basketball myself right stripping it all back and yeah and, and just you know the stuff you say stuff to the kids and then you think about your training session you did that day and you think it's the same it's the same game mm. and my coach says to me before he said it's the same game just taller and faster mm. you know there's a bit few things in between but it's not yeah, a whole lot different but yeah I think it's, it's super important for me personally I think to coach the younger lads and for myself literally being from the same position as them to be in the position I'm in now. I think it's, you know, not, I wouldn't say a duty, but I find it really important for me mm -hmm. to to be that link, you know, and, and hopefully inspire some kids to do the same, to choose the same path that I did. Mm -hmm. Or if not, put them in the best position possible to, to continue their own journey. But coaching's come really, you know, it's been a really natural thing for me. I've, I've really enjoyed it. It's been It's been really good. Um, brings me on nicely to the final question really yeah. um, if you were to speak to a young person uh, who's thinking about a career in sport or maybe more mm. specifically getting involved with basketball what advice would you give to them perseverance and patience is are two big ones for me um, it's going to be up and down and your career is not on a knife's edge mm. I think some people get quite obsessed over certain decisions the coach might make or how they're playing for one season or 
stuff like that and it's not the case but it's consistently turning up every single week loving the game loving whatever you do mm-hmm. um, you know and, and if you don't love it then don't do it you know but if you if you love it and you know you're prepared to be patient and persevere through the tough moments such as injuries or coaching decisions if you get cut from a team and stuff like that you know you can use that as a benefit and it's difficult because you know at the time you think this is over yeah. but there is that There's what you're, you will always get another opportunity it might not be the one you want but it shapes it shapes your, your next steps mm. um, there's always that famous one with Michael Jordan got cut from his high school team ended up being arguably the best player ever to play the game unthinkable just goes to show that you just never know even in you like I said earlier you know, even if in your worst moments or the, what perceived as the worst moments you actually you may get the best opportunity or if you do get the opportunity then make sure you don't waste it because you also don't know when the next one's going to be so that's what I'd uh, that's what I'd say to that I think that's great advice thank you so much for joining us today no, it's been a pleasure thank you oh, it's been a pleasure the pleasure's all been ours and thank you to everyone joining at home thank you for joining us yet again for the Athlete Podcast we'll see you next time cheers